All right, well, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to the latest Drawdown Georgia webinar. It is really great to have you all here. My name is Blair Beasley. I am the Director of Climate Strategies for the Ray C. Anderson Foundation. We have been proud to support Drawdown Georgia and its efforts to grow high impact climate solutions in our state. I am really excited for this discussion today, highlighting what all of us in Georgia can do to be part of the solution. Last year, Drawdown Georgia launched a series of climate solutions toolkits. These toolkits, which you can find on our website, drawdownga.org, um, feature experts from across our state, answering the key questions we all have about switching to an electric vehicle, composting at home and work, adopting a plant-based diet, as well as making our homes more energy efficient. I personally love the section on heat pumps, um, putting rooftop solar on our homes and exploring utility demand response programs. I am thrilled to welcome three of these toolkit authors to share with us today about some of the key findings um, from those toolkits. A few quick programming notes before we dive in. Um, I'm about to briefly introduce our panel and then following their presentations, we're gonna be opening it up for audience Q&A. So please add your questions to the chat box. I think there's a Q&A box and I'll do my best to get to as many of them as possible. Now for our speakers, first we're gonna be hearing from Dory Larson, who is the author on the EV toolkit. Dory is the Electric Transportation Program Manager with the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy. Then we'll hear from Kari Diop, who is an author on the composting toolkit. Kari is the Community Compost Lab Manager for Truly Living Well Center for Natural Urban Agriculture, as well as the founder of Think Green Inc. And then finally, we'll hear from Dr. Keisha Callens, the author on our soon to be released plant-based diet toolkit. Dr. Callens is a Georgia-trained obstetrician gynecologist with Community Healthcare Systems, a federally qualified healthcare network in Central Georgia. As I said, this is a really exciting group. And so with that, Dory, I will turn the mic over to you um, to kick off our program. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Blair, for that introduction and for the opportunity to share with you some information about making the switch from driving uh, to driving electric. And thanks to all of you who've joined in uh, for spending some time with us today. So <clears throat> next slide. If you're not familiar with the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy for over 35 years, SACE has been a regional leader advocating for equitable and responsible energy choices in the Southeast. And as a leading voice for energy policy in our region, SACE is focused on transforming the way we produce and consume energy in the Southeast. Next slide. So with this presentation, I am going to give an overview of EV ownership and then the basics of EV charging, including where to locate charging stations, and then go over some incentive programs that are useful to know. So next slide. So why electric vehicles? Um, if you would hit the next button, there we go. Thanks. Um, the transportation sector overtook the energy sector as the largest contributor of carbon dioxide pollution in the United States or in, uh, around 2017. But there is definitely something that we can do about it, and that's part of what we're talking about today. So next slide, please. Um, so to make sure that we're all level set, plug-in electric vehicles are a category of vehicles that include both plug-in hybrid vehicles, shown in blue, and battery electric vehicles, shown in green. So basically, it's any vehicle that has the ability to plug in and accept electricity as an energy source. So the next slide um, talks about how EVs, uh, the some of the benefits of electric vehicles. So I've been driving electric since 2017, and I love the fact that there are no oil changes with an all electric um, vehicle. So I never have to go in uh, for oil changes. There's very low maintenance. Um, most EV owners charge overnight in their garage, making it even more convenient than stopping for gas. 
They're also very quiet rides. Um, they're safe and they have instant torque. So they've got that instant get up and go makes them a lot of fun to drive. Next slide. And also the, um, if you look at the total lifetime ownership costs, EVs are getting cheaper and with several new cars in the 20 to $30,000 range and more models coming, um, it's making them an even better um, choice. If you look at research from Consumer Reports, it shows that when total ownership costs are considered, including such factors as purchase price, fueling costs, and maintenance expenses, EVs frequently come out ahead, especially in more affordable models. Plus, the Inflation Reduction Act has extended tax credits for up to $7,500 for a new EV for the next 10 years, and I'm going to talk about that later. Next slide, please. So in terms of fueling <clears throat> an electric vehicle, uh, fueling costs are much lower than a traditional uh, internal combustion vehicle. So people frequently ask, well, what's it going to do to my power bill? And as you can see, it costs about 40 to $45 to drive a thousand miles, which is an average month's worth of driving. And gas costs are triple that. And you can see the calculations that I used. And I've got some links um, in the slides that um, help explain the how I got to those calculations as well. Next slide. Um, another question is how far can you go in an EV? And um, it's kind of interesting. So I wanted to show this graph because it really visually points out how far we've come. So when modern all electric vehicles were introduced in model year 2011, there were four models available and the ranges span between 63 and 94 miles with a median range of 68 miles. But over time, the number of models and ranges of EVs has increased. So last year in 2022, the average range climbed to 200 and 91 miles. Next slide. There's also a, a myth, a persistent myth that EVs are just as dirty as driving gas cars. Um, so I wanted to um, highlight that misconception and dispel it. So um, when, as you see, as you can see in the graph in, in Georgia, the average electric vehicle produces under 20% of the emissions of a gasoline vehicle. And the main reason for that is because EVs are so much more energy efficient. Um, the around 20% of the gasoline that's pumped into the car and the fuel tank actually makes the wheels go round and round. But the inverse of that is true for electric vehicles. About 80% of the electrons actually make the car go. So you're using a whole lot less energy to get from point A to point B. So you're creating a whole lot less or fewer emissions to make that happen. Next slide, please. I also wanted to highlight there are tons of electric options that are available for every popular type of vehicle, including F-150 pickup truck, there are minivans, there are SUVs, there are 66 currently offered models and 60 more coming by 2025. So let's, next slide, let's talk about how we charge an electric vehicle. So one way, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a slide. So, yep. Uh, how to, and I, I added this slide in so um, you can find how to browse um, EV models. This is a great website from Plug in America called Plugstar that I wanted to share. All right, so next slide. Now let's talk about how we charge an electric vehicle. Um, so one way is called trickle charging or level one, and it adds about five miles per hour. So if you charge overnight, you can typically replenish what you've used in a day's worth of driving. The second um, type of charging is called level two charging, and that allows about 25 to 60 miles per hour, depending on the, the amps going to the device. Um, these are the types of charging stations that you find around town, and some folks choose to install a charging um, station in their at their home as well. And then the last type is called DC fast charging. And these are the types of chargers that you find along highways, and it allows you to recharge approximately 80% of the battery in a half an hour. And um, also just wanted to point out for the DC fast charging on the bottom, there's two different shapes. Nissan used the shape on the left, but they're phasing it out in their new models. So pretty soon all of the um, DC fast charging shape will be the one on the right, and that'll be consistent. Next slide. So I also just wanted to show kind of a picture of what level one charging looks like. So that's, it's basically a, a glorified uh, electric cord. <laughs> you plug one end into a, a regular 110 outlet in your garage or your home. And then the other um, adapter goes into and plugs into the car. The next slide. 
So these are the level two chargers that you typically find when you're out and about around town. And these are the ones that add 25 to 60 miles per hour. Next slide. And then this is a DC fast charging station. These are the ones that you find typically around highways and they recharge the battery capacity up to about 80% in a half an hour. And those charge times are getting faster uh, as the technology is improving as well. And then the last slide show the next slide about charging. This is a Tesla supercharger. And I just wanted to point out that for level one, two and supercharging is what they call the DC fast charging. The shape is the same. Um, and it is not the same shape as the other models. But there are adapters that you can get so that you can plug a Tesla, char a Tesla car into community charging as well. All right, next slide. So how do we find EV charging? There are lots of helpful apps that you can have on your phone. Um, one that I like to use is called PlugShare. So it allows you to filter the type of car that you have and the type of charging that you're looking for. It works pretty much like Google Maps and it's also crowdsourced. So um, if the charging station is not functioning as well as it should be, other uh, EV drivers can um, look, make that um, notation in the in the app. Also with Tesla, the navigation is built into the car's uh, navigation system. So you type in where you wanna go and then it finds the charging for you automatically. Um, I also wanted to point out that with the bipartisan infrastructure law, um, the NEVI program is investing $7.5 billion in federal funding in the next five years. So there is going to be an inordinate amount more uh, charging infrastructure within the next five years around town and around the country. All right, so um, next slide, Just talking about some of the tax credits. So there are federal tax credits for new vehicles. There are now federal tax credits for used electric vehicles. There are charging, uh, I'm sorry, there are tax credits for charging stations if you want to install one at your home or business. And utilities also have some rebates that are available. So I have links to all of those. Next slide. And then I also included some resources that are really helpful. Um, there is coming up National Drive Electric Earth Day that I know um, the, the Drawdown Georgia is participating in. So it's a link to find events that are happening around uh, near you. Next slide. <clears throat> And then I also wanted to point out, and people don't realize, there is an electric application for every class of truck and medium and heavy duty um, trucks. There are transit and school buses, delivery and garbage trucks that are here today. Every child deserves to ride to school in an emission-free bus. And right now there are quiet garbage trucks and emission-free deliveries happening in towns, but we need to be advocating for more. So I wanted to make sure we're all aware of that. And then the last slide, I just wanted to invite you all to stay connected with um, the Southern Alliance for Clean Energy via our social media channels. We have Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, and also invite you to join our Electrify the Self mailing list to stay current on EV events and to receive any updates via our monthly newsletter. So thanks for your time, I appreciate it. Thank you, Dory, that's incredibly helpful. Um, I know you highlighted some of the new um, tax credits and other subsidies that are coming down from the federal government. As people kind of digest what those are, can you talk about some of the um, decision points people may be making as they think about whether they should lease or own an EV in order to take advantage of some of those programs. Yes, so there are federal tax credits for the purchase of electric vehicles. The Treasury just amended the list of qualified vehicles today. So there are 22 electric vehicles that currently qualify both plug-in hybrid and fully electric that, um, that qualify for those tax credits. But the leasing allows you to use another tax credit, um, the commercial vehicle tax credit um, that opens it up to more models that are available. So if the particular model you're not that you're looking at, if you can't use it to purchase and get the tax credit, a great option would be looking at leasing that vehicle because then it would qualify for the tax credits that the dealer may be able to pass on. Fantastic. Thank you so much. All right, we're going to keep moving. Um, I'm going to pass the mic over to you, Kari, to talk about composting. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, good after, good morning, everyone. My name is Kari Diop. I'm the uh, Community Composting Lab Manager at Truly Living Well Center for Natural Urban Agriculture in Southwest Atlanta. And today we're going to be just giving a kind of overview of 
composting, um, particularly home composting, things that you can do um, at your own house um, to help to mitigate the um, uh, the harmful gases that are produced when we put our food scraps in the trash and send them to the landfill. So I think we'll begin with just an overall discussion of what is composting. Next slide. Okay, it looks like may have a little technical issue, um, but I'll just get into it. So composting is really the natural process of recycling organic matter. Um, if you think about it, many of us already put, uh, participate in recycling programs. We recycle glass, paper, aluminum cans. Um, you know, so, sometimes we take our plastic bags back to the grocery store if we still use plastic bags. I know I do sometimes. Um, and so kind of taking that to the next level uh, would be recycling our organics. So uh, all of our kitchen scraps, fruits and vegetable um, scraps that you don't actually utilize when you're cooking, or maybe that, uh, you know, that, that bag or uh, container of uh, leafy greens that you forgot in the back of your refrigerator that didn't quite make it to the mill and ended up rotting. What, what do you do with those other than throw them into the, the garbage and send them um, away? Who knows where away is, right? Um, oftentimes away is a landfill. And when those things reach the landfill, they get buried. And um, because there is, very little to no oxygen in those um, piles in the landfill, they produce uh, harmful gases, particularly methane, but also uh, carbon carbon dioxide, which we know contributes to greenhouse gas. So um, let's see if the next slide will work. Okay. Is it just me or is it uh, not showing properly? It's showing up for us, we can see it. Okay, fantastic. And it looks good. Um, okay, good. So let's, let's actually go back to the previous one. All right, so um, again, composting is a natural process and, and, and the end goal, the result is producing a natural fertilizer that we can utilize in our gardens or in our house plants to help our, um, our plants grow healthier and stronger and produce more beautiful blooms and more prolific fruit, um, things that can help enhance our, our health and our quality of life. So. Um, the way this works is anything that grows is going to decompose eventually. Um, you know, we've all seen this happen. Composting is actually where we uh, take on the process ourselves and it helps to actually speed it up because we're providing the perfect environment for all of the microorganisms that actually do the decomposing, the bacteria, the fungi, um, the micro and macro arthropods or bugs that help to break things down. We're providing a perfect space for them to actually do their work and to speed up the process. And the end result is this beautiful thing that's often called black gold that again, we can use in our gardens and um, to and, you know, help our plants grow bigger. So next slide. Some of the benefits of composting. Um, the first one is reducing the waste stream. I think that's something we all can um, get behind. We want to lessen the amount of materials that we're sending to our landfills um, in order to uh, protect the environment. Um, uh, secondly, it's going to cut down methane emissions, which we talked about. Um, when we're properly composting um, in an environment that is aerobic or has air, then the only byproducts is, are going to be, uh, you know, carbon dioxide and um, uh, H2O, which is steam. It also is going to improve the soil health and lessen erosion. So typically, um, when when organic matter decomposes, it's, it's going to go, it's going to undergo an aerobic decomposition, meaning that it's broken down by microbes that need uh, water. I mean, need air. Sorry, but because our you know our solid waste infrastructure is designed around landfilling, only about six percent of the food waste um, that we throw away actually gets composted. Um, a, a full third of what we throw away. Uh, can actually be composted. So um, if we want to look at uh, states and cities and in individual businesses, we can all, you know, spearhead uh, uh, doing this organic recycling. Um, it's also going to uh, conserve water. So um, composting actually helps to hold water in the soil. And um, that's going to mean less necessity for uh, bringing in water to, um, you know, grow our plants. 
And then we also gonna reduce our personal food waste. So these are some benefits. Next slide. So how do we compost? Um, well, you can home compost, that's what I do. And I do that in a, in a, in a bin, but you can also just do that in a pile. Um, really the, the essence of composting is creating a pile. That's it, that's really the, 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 the end all and be all. You're gonna create a pile that gets big enough to heat up and um, eventually break down. Another way that people compost, that you can compost at home is trench composting. That's where you're actually digging a trench in the ground and putting your, your vegetable and fruit waste um, in that trench and having it break down naturally directly in the soil. And then the third way is vermicomposting. And that's where you use worms to actually break down your compost. And many times people would do that in the bin. You can do that you know, underneath their kitchen sink or in your garage. Um, and then the, the, the final way that I think that you can also compost is a compost pickup service. So we have um, a really big, uh, great compost pickup service called Compost Now here in Georgia that will actually come and pick up um, a bucket that they will provide for you off of your, um, you know, your porch or your, uh, from your doorstep. And they will take that and compost it and then they'll bring it back, bring you back um, compost throughout the year. All right, next slide. So we're gonna talk in, talk about, talk a little bit about um, backyard composting. So, so most of the time you're gonna start composting in a pile um, or you can do it in an enclosed bin. The first step is really just to save your fruit and vegetable kitchen scraps. These are um, the green materials that you put in your compost and they're high in nitrogen. Uh, you can do this in a bucket or you can also use a recycled container I like to store mine in the freezer just because it means less trips out to the compost bin or the compost pile. And also storing it in the freezer is good because when the um, when the organic material, the you know fruit and veggie scraps actually freezes, it changes the um, the the makeup of the material. And when it thaws, uh, pretty much your composting has already begun because the cells have after thawing are already breaking down. So. Um, storing it in the freezer is a great way if you have room. Um, and then the second part of that process collect, is collecting your carbon rich materials or what we call grounds. So those are things like leaves, grass clippings, um, wood chips and shredded paper or cardboard. Next slide. Um, and so uh, oftentimes, um, you know, beginning compost, we're, we're starting doing what we call cold composting. A lot of us who are gardeners, um, or if you just have a yard, a lot of times you'll throw your yard waste over in a pile somewhere. So that's cold composting where you're not really managing the pile per se. You just are piling things in a, in a central location and letting them sort of break down um, sort of naturally. It's passive. There's, there's really minimal intervention. Just putting things in the pile. And, you know, it can take about a year or two for things to kind of break down completely and you'll be able to use that compost you know, in your, in your, um, in your garden or in your yard. A lot of times, because there's no uh, movement of the pile, you're not actually doing anything to manage it. It can, it, it, it's, 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 anaer it's an anaerobic process, meaning it, there's not a lot of oxygen. So a lot of times if you'll turn over a pile that it, you're doing cold composting with, you'll notice some, some, some smells which aren't as pleasant, but that's simply because there's the lack of oxygen and the microbes that are actually doing the breaking down um, that don't need oxygen, at least, you know, smells which aren't that great. But if you're interested in doing kind of a, a more active compost, and if you're really ready to jump in feet first, then you can do hot composting. Um, that's more of an active process where you are turning the piles more frequently. Um, you're really making sure that you have the right ratio of browns to greens. And if you do that properly, you know, you're turning your pile every three to three, three to five days, you can have compost really in, in, in four weeks, but we like to say 60 to 90 days, because even once you have a finished compost or something that you would recognize as compost, um, you want to let that uh, cure for, you know, another four weeks or so. So 60 to 90 days. Um, again, this is an aerobic process, meaning the microorganisms that are actually doing the breaking down of the compost need oxygen, which is why you're turning the pile. So next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about um, the ins and outs. So how, how do you combine the materials, these browns and these greens? Uh, you really want to focus on the ratio, which is a three to one ratio of browns to greens. So all of your kind of 
uh, woody material. And, and we call them browns mainly because they are dry and a lot of times are brown. So your wood chips, your leaves, your grass clippings, all of those things, we, we wanna put three times as much of those in our pile as we put in greens. Um, and then also we wanna turn our pile at least weekly, but um, you know, every three days you're gonna have compost a lot faster. Uh, you also want to add water when you notice your pile is kind of drying out and not to the point where it's soaking wet, but you do want your pile to remain moist because remember the actual, um, the, the little guys that are actually doing the composting, they need the same thing that all them things need, which is air and water and food. Um, so we're providing the food for them by, you know, putting in the greens and the browns. Um, we're giving them air um, by turning the pile. And then sometimes uh, if our ratios are off a little bit, um, then we may need to provide them some moisture, which means taking your hose and watering your pile, or if you have a watering can, you can water your pile as well. Also something else you wanna do when you get to a more advanced kind of composting is checking your temperatures. Ideally, we want the temperatures to reach 131 degrees. That's gonna kill off all harmful pathogens or weed seeds. Um, or you know anything that might persist in the pile that uh, could be harmful to our health or the health of our plants. Um, so that's basically the gist of composting. Uh, you know I'm available to open up in, to answer any questions you all may you all may have. But of course there's a, a you know a plethora of material online, um, and uh, the Drawdown Georgia website also has lots of great material and in their toolkit that you can use to learn about composting. Awesome. Thank you so much. And um, a good plug and a reminder to put any questions you have um, in the Q&A box, because we're going to circle back to those at the end. But one quick question for you now, um, if people who are listening in are interested in getting started, what would you tell them about like a common mistake you see people make when they first start trying to compost at home? Yeah, one of the biggest mistakes people make um, is, is dealing with the ratio. Uh, you know, they either have too much green, so too much of their kitchen scraps or leftovers that they put in the pile and not enough brown, um, or too much brown and, and not enough green. So really making sure that you have that, that kind of sweet spot ratio, which is three browns to greens. So say you're putting in a, a bucket of your fruit and vegetable waste, you want to make sure you're putting in three buckets uh, or handfuls, if, if you know, you're not producing that much, of the brown material, so the wood chips or the... Um, shredded paper or grass clippings or dryer lint. Um, all those things are, you know, uh, great as brown materials. Um, so really making sure you tweak your ratio so that, you know, you're, you're getting the right mix of greens and browns. And also, you know, maybe starting off too big is a lot of people's problems. So I always recommend people start small, just get in the habit of saving your scraps and getting those scraps out either to the garden or in your bucket to be picked up by a compost service. And maybe the third thing would just be make to start with a cold pile. It, you know, it's going to require a whole lot less management. You can kind of set it and forget it. As long as you're getting your materials out to the pile, eventually it's going to break down. But again, if you want to speed up the process, then you can do more active composting and get out there and turn that pile a lot more, get your exercise in. So. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Callens for our final presentation about plant-based diets. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. Also, a special thank you to our two previous presenters. I am now very interested in looking at both of those things. I had an interest in um, considering an electric vehicle, and so that was a really good overview. And then composting is just something I hadn't really thought of. And so thank you for that introduction and I'll do, definitely do some follow-up. And with that, I get a chance to talk to you about a very important part of what we can do in terms of the solution towards the climate crisis. And so I've been very bold and I've just titled this presentation, Living a Plant-Powered Life. Um, just really, it's all about mindset. And I want to ask everyone to keep an open mind because of some of the things that I will share with you will challenge you just a little bit. And in full disclosure, um, as a physician, I would ask you to eat healthy anyway. So everything that we're talking about is right in line with what we would recommend. However, I would like to spend some time today presenting just how um, beneficial those choices can be for our environment as well. Next slide. 
So I try to break this down into the five W's. So who are we really trying to um, incorporate or really address with um, our efforts? One, we want to welcome you, your family, your friends, your coworkers, your entire community. And what exactly um, would this entail? Just asking you to really consider getting more of your nutrition from plant-based sources. And that we'll discuss a little bit later how that can be helpful to our environment. And then when do I want you to do it? All the time. I want you to consider doing this at breakfast, lunch, dinner, and even for your snacks. And then where um, can you implement this? I want you to do it everywhere. I want you to do it at home, when you go out to a restaurant to eat. And even when you go on vacation, I want you to think about your food choices. And then why is this important? The goal is to really reduce our carbon footprint. And when we do that, we actually do have an opportunity to really um, address the climate crisis. And so it's really important to realize that you can do something even as a single person, because our efforts become cumulative when we do them as a group. And then that over time will really make an impact. Next slide. So I wanted to just simplify for everyone. When we talk about the carbon footprint, what exactly does that mean? And I'll just be very brief. Um, so there are three main things that um, are considered um, harmful greenhouse gases. Methane, and I'm going to go chemistry-wise um, <laughs> just for just a bit. So um, cows and other ruminant animals like sheep and goats, um, as part of their natural digestion, they actually release methane into the atmosphere. And also their man manure also will um, release methane. And that is one of the gases that can um, be, can be accumulated and then can be harmful to the atmosphere. In addition, nitrous oxide, which we get from um, use of fertilizers, that can also be a source. And believe it or not, I'm sure many people are not surprised, we see deforestation happening a lot in our state, um, but that also impacts carbon dioxide. And that's because we need green leaves for the natural ecosystem to work well. So when we're aggressively cutting down trees, um, that's being done usually for um, you know, industry or even to um, create more farmlands for animals, but that process also um, offsets our ecosystem. So that all contributes to that carbon footprint and then that's what is contributing to our climate crisis. Next slide. So I wanted you to really think about, um, and this is where I'm going with this. So the goal is we want to limit our intake of meat products. That's the overarching themes. And I think pictures really do speak a lot. And so just removing beef from the typical American diet can really lower that carbon footprint by 25%. And if you think about it, if each person made a conscious effort to do that, Again, it's that cumulative effect that would happen. And so, um, you know, really when I say that, I mean, people are thinking, oh, I have to give something up. But what we're really asking is for you just to change the proportion or change your preferences for how you include meat products in your diet. Next slide. When we look at um, the impact of what we can do as individuals, I found this graph to be extremely important because you look at the things that we can do that really contribute to the greenhouse gases and that carbon footprint. And I didn't highlight everything here because I don't want people to think that you can't take vacation and get on a plane and go to Australia. You can totally do that if you want to. But there are some things that you might find that are very achievable um, that we can do. And one of those things, as you see here, actually um, you know, limiting dairy products, but also not eating red meat. So little changes can really make a cumulative difference. And I want to make sure that takeaway happens today um, in terms of the fact that even as an individual, you can actually start making a difference in terms of how we approach that. Next slide. So I found this quote yesterday and I absolutely loved it. So individually we're a one drop, but together we are an ocean. And so individual acts can definitely grow into influential group activity. And the really good takeaway here is that consumer demand will absolutely um, influence the industry. So probably, you know, 10 years ago, um, you know, organic needs were something that we would not find readily in the supermarket. But now because there's a demand for that, a lot of places will offer that. Similarly, as we change our selection and change that um, supply request, then, um, then that will also be reflected in our grocery stores and our farmers markets. And so it will not happen overnight, but definitely by changing our choices can do that. So again, one of the effective things that we can do absolutely is to eat less red meat. Next slide. So just taking a quick deep dive. So switching to a plant-based diet has the potential to really offset the heating effect from greenhouse gases. 
and that can, it, it can actually limit um, global warming by about two degrees, that's a big deal. And when we think about all the unusual weather events that we've had over the past year or two, we can definitely see that we are being impacted um, by the climate crisis. And so if there's something that we can do that will have a lasting effect for future generations, then I think it's something we should absolutely consider. In addition, if you are going to reach for animal products, then the recommendation would be for you to think about things that are sustainably um, sourced or pasture raised options. And so just to quickly talk about that, there's some thought that if you do um, pasture fed animals, then they do take longer to grow. So technically they would be belching more, releasing more methane into the atmosphere. Also there's more manure, but the process of being um, pasteurized because of the grazing process and how that incorporates into the soil, actually over time, they actually decrease overall emissions. And so if you are going to select um, animal products, then I would recommend if at all possible to reach for the pasture raised options. Next slide. So big disclaimer, I'm not asking you to become a vegan or a vegetarian unless you really want to, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. I'm not saying give up everything that you love. I'm Jamaican. I love to eat my oxtails every now and then. And so I'm gonna be able to maintain that but still be able to make a difference overall. So you do not have to do that unless you really want to. Next slide. But I am gonna introduce some terminology because a lot of times people do like to identify with terms, right? And so I'm gonna introduce a couple of um, terminology that you can choose from if you want to identify with a particular group. So one is you can become a climatarian and the theme is very simple, less meat, less heat. So that's an option for you. Next slide. You can become a flexitarian. And I actually really love this slide. If you look at the bottom section, it really talks about what the beginner can agree to, what the intermediate can agree to, and then what the advanced. And the advanced flexitarian is someone who is really doing plant-based sources primarily for five days out of the seven days a week. So if you think about it, you still have two days where you could get some of your favorite items. You don't have to give it up completely, but believe it or not, every small change, even at the beginner level, will start to make an impact. Next slide you could become a planetarian. This gets really interesting. So I'm giving plenty of options for whatever group you want to identify with. And I did find a group online here. You can see they had a challenge that was done in 2021 where you could do two plant-based meals for two weeks. And so if you wanted to do like a workplace challenge, you know, like we do the biggest loser, you could do like a planetarian challenge for the office setting. That's an opportunity to also introduce that as well. And next slide. And while we're thinking about that, you know, titles are really important. As you know, um, with the release of the, the new Taylor Swift album, people are now referring to themselves as Swifties. And so technically you could become a planty if you wanted to even go there and have the pop culture theme added to that. So here are a couple of questions that I wanna address really quickly when we recommend um, that people consider a plant-based diet. Number one, are you going to get enough protein? And I have two very important pictures on here. So the first one, if you think about it, everyone, well, I'm dating myself, but you probably remember Popeye. He pulled out a can of spinach and his muscles got really big. And so it didn't make sense to me until I was really doing this, um, doing the research um, to prepare the toolkit that you know spinach is a, actually a really good source of protein. And so I want you to know that you can still get your adequate protein from plant-based sources. And um, there is some benefit in terms of sometimes even digestion added benefits from having plant-based sources of protein. I also want to include this ballerina. And um, if we have a chance to share this presentation, there's a link that I have, but I looked up diets that ballerinas incorporate because they have to have really strong muscles. They do very strenuous training and activity, and they actually do a lot of plant-based food um, sources in order for them to maintain that. And so I really wanted to um, put that out here. So if you get a chance to just Google like a ballerina diet, they actually have lots of information about how they eat and they are very heavy in terms of plant-based sources for their, um, for their intake to be able to, to sustain um, their training and also to improve their performance. Next slide. Can, you, can a plant-based diet actually impact your health? Absolutely. Um, lots of research, research shows that there can be benefits to heart disease, diabetes, and even high blood pressure. So there's benefits here. Um, so as a physician, I'm thinking about both prevention, but also management and treatment. And so in the event that you do um, acquire one of these chronic diseases, 
changes in your diet can actually impact and sometimes even reverse that. And so I wanted to make sure that people realize that there is a lot of benefit from really considering a plant-based diet. And again, in full disclosure, I would recommend this type of diet <laughs> as a practitioner. And then also there are lots of benefits to the immune system. Um, the last two years um, with us having lived through a pandemic, you know, your immune system is very important to how you um, function and to your overall well-being. And so again, a plant-based diet can actually support that as well. Next slide. So will it cost more um, for a plant-based diet? This is a big and important question. A lot of talk about inflation, the cost of everything everyone has known it has really um, changed in the past couple of years. And so my answer is going to be yes. And there are a lot of ways that this can happen. Number one, buying local, utilizing your local farmer's markets can really make a difference. Um, number two, eating from the rainbow. So when you're going to the store looking at green peppers, bell peppers, red bell peppers, yellow bell peppers, carrots, really making sure that your grocery cart has an array of the different colors in terms of vegetable options that you can afford. Buying in season is also helpful in terms of cost. So trying to get strawberries at the wrong time will cost you a lot more versus other times where you can get two for five. And so really thinking about um, adjusting your um, grocery list based on things that are in season. The other thing is buying fresh or frozen. Um, so believe it or not, frozen vegetables are actually usually quite fresh when they're prepared. And so a lot of times when I talk to patients about, you know, making um, food choices and wood products, the only thing that you should really be eating that is from a bag is a frozen vegetable. And so <laughs> that is actually the case here too. And then buying in bulk. So one of the things that is common in a lot of our plant-based recipes would be um, eating a lot of beans and peas and seeds. You can buy those in bulk and they can last longer. And so that's another opportunity for you to actually have cost savings. Next slide. So will you need extra supplements if you eat less meat? So it's kind of a yes or no question. If you are going to become a vegan or vegetarian, then that's going to limit some of your normal sources of B12, for example. And so if you're not eating meat products, that might be an issue and you might need to have a specific supplement. But if you're just reducing your meat intake and you're still incorporating other vegetables that support um, or give you vitamin B12, then that's going to be covered. So believe it or not, salmon has quite a good amount of B12. And as you can see on this picture, a lot of things you probably recognize, nuts and seeds and avocados, things that you probably would um, consider eating or are already eating. And so you would be able to maintain an appropriate diet, even if you decided to eat less meat. Next slide. So will you get bored in a plant-based diet? Probably not. Um, I want you to really channel your creative energy. And when the toolkit gets posted, we have information about really, you know, taking your taste buds on an adventure around the world. There's so many different ways you can prepare meals um, based on the different continents. And so really, um, you know, using your um, relationships with friends who are from different places and really learning from their cultures about how they prepare different foods absolutely needs to be a collaborative effort with your family and friends. You don't want to be isolated by your choices. And also one thing that I really liked um, in terms of research was a mix and match of meal prep. And so if you buy cauliflower, flour, for example, you might do a cauliflower salad one day that week. You might do some um, um, a cauliflower soup, or you can do riced cauliflower with later on. And so there you can use like one vegetable and make several different things. And so really using the mix and match meal trip actually helps cost savings too, because if you buy a big um, cauliflower, you need to use it up, but you can do some different things. Um, some restaurants actually now offer um, like a, um, it's instead of having like chicken wings, you can have, you know, like spicy cauliflower. And so again, just being very creative. Next slide. So let me show you the way. So I wanted to share with you a little bit about, you know, you know, when I make recommendations, like, you know, how can we make that applicable? And eating in, so for breakfast, you could just have oatmeal with dried fruit. For lunch, you could have a black bean burger. That's something you can probably access readily. Um, at home, you can buy black bean burgers in the grocery store. And then for dinner, you could do chicken lettuce wraps. There, you've already had only one meal with a protein, and that, mo that meal in the dinner time is actually just chicken. So again, that's not a bad day in terms of eating. And a lot of people now are actually doing intermittent fasting. And so most times you're actually just going to probably do two meals for the day, which makes that idea even easier to consider. When you're eating out, what does that look like for you? A veggie omelet could work. Um, that would qualify. For lunch, you could do pizza with veggie toppings. 
And then this is a favorite. I actually did this this week and I went to a um, Thai restaurant and they asked you what protein. And I thought, huh, I can have tofu. And there you go. You know, you're, you're really making um, choices. And so again, um, I think it's not as challenging as you might think, but just the awareness of your choices with each meal is an opportunity for you to do that. Next slide. So here's a, a good um, website that I've wanted to recommend. I have, I'm subscribed to this and it, it's called Plant Powered and they send recipes all the time, but it's from the Eating Well magazine. And so that's something you can Google and look at and uh, lots of good recipes there. Next slide. So elevator pitch. I wanted to include this because you probably are thinking about it now, but how are you going to convince your family at home to join you in the process? And so you can adjust this pitch um, accordingly, um, but you might say to your coworker, you know, do you know what you can do to help with climate change? Cutting back on bread meat is good for the planet and also good for your health. So while I won't ask you to stop eating burgers, I will ask you to eat burgers less often. And when you do, eat pasture-picked burgers. You're in control. You can start right away. No need to delay. Real quick. You can shorten it. You can extend it. But you got to have your pitch ready because your family member is going to look at you, probably like you have two heads. I'm doing what? We're having tofu for what? And so <laughs> just be prepared for that. Next slide. So our last slide. So what's your why? And we actually have three whys on here. You may want to select one, two, or all three. Um, Plant-based eating can preserve the ecosystem and the environment. Plant-based eating can absolutely support a healthy lifestyle for you, your family, and your community. But this last one is really important. Plant-based eating can actually make a difference for future generations. And so I love this graphic. We only have one planet Earth. Eat like you live here. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Callens. That was great. I know um, this is, like you said, the newest of the toolkits. It's going to be really released in the coming days. Um, so I wonder if there is something that kind of stood out to you as you were putting it together, like either an aha moment or a really interesting fact um, that you want to share. Sure. So I actually am kind of converted now and um, I've made a lot of different choices. I got a caramel macchiato yesterday and for the first time, instead of getting regular milk, I got um, coconut milk. And so I'm just really being very thoughtful about my choices. As I mentioned, I went to the Thai restaurant and I had tofu as opposed to having um, some other kind of protein. And so just been very thoughtful about that. And I think that's been interesting. But what I didn't realize was really the the connection between agriculture and the carbon footprint. I really did not have that concept kind of wrapped up for me. And so really thinking about that um, was very, was a good aha moment. And also just realizing that even as a single person, I can make an impact now with sharing it with my family, my friends, my patients. And so hopefully um, the message will spread. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. I am going to invite our other two panelists to rejoin us um, with their screens on as we're going to dive through some of the questions that have come up. Um, I'm going to start with you, Dory. There were several questions that came into the chat just about how much cleaner um, changing to an electric vehicle really is. Um, what if your electricity um, is still produced by coal? What about the batteries and kind of that life cycle analysis? So um, can you talk a little bit about, about some of those um, issues? Sure. And I should have left it in my presentation. I was trying to keep it at <laughs> the time constraint. So I took it out, but uh, people are always curious about that, rightfully so. Um, so replacing gasoline with, or if, if you're still using uh, coal as your main power supply, um, it still reduces energy use when you're driving electric by 31%. So I think that that's, that's great. And another point is that a lot of our, uh, like coal has actually become less of a power source than renewable energy in the United States as of last year. So more and more coal is coming offline, which is fantastic. Um, the other question is about the battery and the carbon footprint for the battery. Um, so analysis has been done and manufacturing the battery consumes the energy equivalent of about 74 gallons of gasoline. So it doesn't take very long to get through 74 gallons of gasoline before you're carbon neutral with the battery. Um, I, I can also share a link, but Yale did a study where they looked at um, the lifespan and um, the author said that she was just amazed at how many emissions are coming from the upstream um, emissions of the 
fossil fuel industry. Um, and her quote is, it's the surprising element was how much lower the emissions of electric vehicles were. The supply chain for combustion vehicles is just so dirty that electric vehicles can't surpass them, even when you factor in indirect emissions. And then the other interesting thing about the batteries that Bill was asking about um, is, you know, we certainly need to be aware of the ecological, ecological um, impacts of the mining um, and the, the need to make sure that we are doing the mining in a way that preserves integrity to indigenous communities and, um, and the environment. Um, we can recycle the components of, of batteries, which is really important. So 95% of the minerals and the uh, components of a battery can be recycled. And it's going to, as we're scaling up the number of EVs being built, going to become imperative that manufacturers are using recycled components to make it cheaper, cost-effective, and less environmentally impactful. Um, to the point that Redwood um, battery recycling has started uh, a project, a $2 billion um, facility outside of Charleston where they're going to be recycling the battery components because they they recognize that they need to be doing that and having a closed loop for the batteries. So I hope that those answer some of those questions. Yeah, that's great. And I'll note that you also address many of these issues in that toolkit. So if people want to go back and see another reference, Story does a great job in the toolkit as well. Um, Kari, we have several questions around composting. One is about um, smell as well as attracting vermin. Um, can you talk about ways that you can avoid some of those issues if you do choose to compost at home in your backyard? Yeah, for sure. I mean, smell is always like a persistent kind of question for folks only because we are familiar with the smell of rotten veggies for the most part. And it, you know, it stinks, it's funky. Um, a way that you can kind of manage that with your compost is again, just being real conscious of your ratio um, and um, turning the power more frequently. Usually the smells are the result of those anaerobic microbes, you know, releasing um, alcohols, other chemicals that um, are, you know, gonna get funky, so methane. Um, so if we can incorporate more oxygen into the power, then we're gonna encourage the aerobic bacteria that produce that rich kind of earthy smell that many of us who are growers, you know, know and love, or, you know, when you walk through a forest, that kind of fresh green um, smell, that's what you'll get when you have a healthy compost. Um, so making sure that your ratios are right. You know, like I said, I can't stress enough that three to one, you want to make sure there's enough browns um, to your greens. And then also making sure your panel is turned or you're turning your power more frequently to encourage more air getting into the power. But if you really want to get high tech, you can, um, you know, do something that we do over at Truly Living Well, which is uh, force air into the power. So there are systems where you can use a, a blower to push air into the power. Um, so those are the main things you can do to kind of mitigate the smell piece around the, um, the critter piece. You know, if you have an open pile, you know, creatures are going to come. They like to eat the same things we like to eat for the most part. So either you make peace with that or you can compost in a, an enclosed bin. So a lot of times people have seen a tumbler. Uh, this looks like a barrel, so to speak, that you put your compost in. And it's, it's, it's completely enclosed, so it doesn't have any um, way that the critters can come and access. And so if they don't have any way to come and access, then, you know, they, they, won't, they won't come around. Um, there's also a, 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 like a three-bend system that you'll see in a lot of community gardens um, called a compost knox, like Fort Knox. Um, and, and basically what it does is it completely encloses your pile in, um, in a mesh called, um, uh, what is it called? It's like a, uh, um, a chicken wire or a woven um, mesh that will completely enclose the pile and not give those critters access to get into it. So again, it's gonna have a lot to do with your, your bin design. Um, and also if you're just doing an open pile, if you uh, adequately cover the green materials that you put in, 
then, you know, there won't be as much of a smell to attract those critters to your pile. So making sure that you adequately cover your pile with brown materials uh, will help to sort of mitigate those, those, uh, those creature intrusions. Thank you. There's one kind of related question, Kari, before we move on. Do you have any experience with composting machines? Someone put in one L-O-M-I. I'm not familiar with it. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, I've people. seen those. Yeah, Do you have any idea if those are worth worth the money for people who cannot compost outside at home? Uh, what, what those basically do is um, um, dehydrate and heat up the material. So at the end, you get a, you get, um, a, not fully decomposed, but you get a dried out organic material that you can then add to your, you know, soil, whether it's your potted plants or to your garden. Um, it, it doesn't really produce what I would call a compost. You know, a compost is really the result of the aerobic decomposition of the organic material. That's not what's going on in those, but it does kind of give you a great basis for uh, material that you can add to your compost. It actually produces a, a a, a, a very good brown that you can, you know, kind of put in that brown category. But um, I wouldn't really call that compost. And it's a good, um, it's a good, I guess, solution if you're limited in space and you know you have the financial wherewithal to spend on that on that type of system. But again, if you're if you're limited in space, you don't really have a place to put a pile. Um, you know, there are a couple of things you can do. One is you can kind of uh, outsource your compost into a company like Compost Now will come and pick it up. You can also, like I said, do uh, worm compost and a vermicomposting that you can use um, uh, like a tote that you are probably familiar with. And you can, you know, add your scraps to that with a, a nice bedding material for the worms to live in. And that will keep everything kind of neat and tidy. And it can, you know, exist in a small space, either under your counter, off in the garage, it can even go outside. Um, and, and kind of the third thing you can do is, is look for a community garden in your area. Um, you can check the American Community Gardening Association's website. They have uh, a map with community gardens located all across the nation. You can find something that's close to you. Oftentimes, the community garden will have already a compost pile or a composting system that they're that they're um, that they're working with that you can just bring your kitchen scraps to and add. Not only does that give you a kind of convenient solution for what you can do with your um, organic waste, but it also is going to benefit that community garden. And you may even be inspired to join and grow some of your own veggies there too. So those are great solutions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask our last question to Dr. Callens before we wrap up. There was questions about whether um, plant-based diets are appropriate for children. Um, the person who asked was specifically interested in whether a vegan diet could be appropriate for children. I don't know if you have thoughts in that space. So I'm not a pediatrician, so I'm going to give you my thoughts as a mom. <laughs> and then, of course, I would always recommend that you have a conversation with your pediatrician regarding, um, you know, choices or diets for children. Um, but I do think if there was ever a time where you could comfortably be vegan or vegetarian, it's now. Those options are so readily available um, in terms of what we have to offer in the grocery store, but also even eating out. And so great time um, where I think if you had a child that was comfortable doing that or that's what the family decided, that child should not feel um, excluded in terms of their choices. Um, I do think it's a great opportunity um, in terms of a healthy diet. Um, the one thing I would say that if you decide to become vegan or vegetarian, um, just being very careful about supplementation for specific vitamins um, that tend to be in higher doses sometimes in meat-based products or even in fish. And so um, there are some supplements that can kind of help to make sure there are no deficiencies in that area. So that would be, again, a good conversation to have with the pediatrician about um, what is the best source of any supplements um, that would be helpful. And that's a good point. Um, I had a patient recently who mentioned that she was um, vegetarian and I talked to her a little bit. Um, she did not eat any fish. Um, she did eat eggs, um, but was not aware that she could have a B12 deficiency. And so I think that education really needs to happen across the board. Um, we can get most of what we need from our vegetable um, plant sources and our nuts and our seeds and legumes. I mean, really you will get what you need, but there are a couple of small things that um, are probably worth um, you know, getting through a supplement. Um, but in terms of a child, I would not have an objection. Um, my son is 18 now. And so convincing him to go vegan at this point might be a little bit of a challenge. 
Um, but I think maybe I could present it if I introduced it slowly. And again, the goal is not to go from, um, you know, completely um, eliminating meat from the diet, but just really to change the number of days. And so um, there's a popular term now, meatless Mondays, or just thinking about, you know, how to gently um, encourage or incorporate that into the diet. And I think that's something that um, we can all benefit from um, just kind of stepping into that role as opposed to completely cutting off the things that we're used to. So hopefully that offered some advice. Thank you, Dr. Helms. That's really helpful. Well, I'm going to um, close us for today. I want us to say thank you to our panelists. These were really fantastic presentations. And thank you to everyone who joined us for these discussions. We will be posting the video of this conversation on the Drawdown Georgia website in the coming days. So feel free um, to share a link with your networks then. Um, and if you want to dig into any of the toolkits that you've heard about or explore others, those are also on the website at drawdownga.org and Dr. Callen's new um, toolkit on plant-based diets should be up very soon. So thank you all again. We, we really appreciate you spending some time with us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.